I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome to this, a bonus episode of The Physical Performance Show, brought to you by the upcoming online World First Masters Athlete Symposium, being brought to you by The Physical Performance Show and also Function to Fitness and Valed Performance. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist and exercise scientist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. And of course, we do this across a range of different episodes, expert editions, interest editions, featured performers and coaches corners. And this is a bonus episode to whet your appetite for what will be a fantastic day of learnings. This coming Saturday, the 8th of August for the Masters Athlete Online Symposium. Now, what makes this symposium so unique is that It is the world's first symposium to focus exclusively on the master's athlete. What is a master's athlete? That is anyone who is plus the age of 35 years. And the other thing that makes this symposium so unique is that it is 100% free to absorb the learnings on the day. That's right, 100% free to register. The full suite of recordings, materials, and a stack of bonuses will be available for a small fee following this symposium. But if you are interested in mastering the master's athlete, you are not going to want to miss the online one-day symposium this coming Saturday, August the 8th. Now, on this bonus episode, the aim is simple, to share some snippets with you from several of our 16 featured experts who will be presenting on the day. We are thrilled with the lineup of speakers, several of who you will hear from on this bonus episode of the Physical Performance Show, but the topics to be explored include physiology of the master's athlete, strength and conditioning for the master's athlete, navigating menopause for the female master's athlete, running through and with knee osteoarthritis for the master's athlete, mental health for the master's athlete, running injury free for the master's athlete, the rehabilitation of cycling injuries and lower back pain, along with hamstring tendon injuries of the Masters athlete. I'll also be presenting on the five considerations for the Masters triathlete. So before you tune in to these learnings today, be sure to do one thing, and that is to jump over to masterathletes.online to register for this free symposium. Masterathletes.online. M-A-S-T-E-R athletes.online. One more time, masterathletes.online and be sure to be registered for this fantastic free event. And here is a snippet from former The Physical Performance Show alumni, Dr. Rich Willey, sharing around considerations for the Masters runner. So I think first, let's go ahead and define some terms here. So the Masters runner, uh, I think that uh, there's some different definitions out there. Uh, And USA Track and Field, for instance, uh, uses 40 years of age and, and older to define the master's runner, whereas World Masters Athletics uh, defines the master's runner as 35 years of age. And um, one of the things that's that's important to keep in mind with them is that uh, the master's runner, even though a lot of times we kind of think about the the elite athlete or maybe the the teenage athlete as being your primary runners, but it's actually the fastest growing segment of marathoners in the world right now. And since 2016, it's been uh, greater than 50% of all marathoners. So if you're not... um, if you're not already seeing a lot of masters runners, um, you will certainly begin to start seeing more and more as more of the runners will kind of shift into this older uh, age category. So, and and just because we age doesn't necessarily mean that we're running slow. So Marika uh, Ugeto, uh is a Japanese runner. She's 60 years of age. She holds the world record uh, for her age category, half marathon at, a, uh, at a, just an hour and 24 minutes is, is just unbelievably fast. And even faster than that, I believe is that 256 marathon. So really, really just uh, unbelievable times that we're still seeing in, in master's runners. Um, but one of the things that happens as we age is that running speed does decline. And so this is the world record, world record marathon pace that is um, across the age span. 
And what happens initially between the ages of 30 and 50, we actually see just a very, very small decline in uh, overall world record marathon pace. And just, you know, it's just three and a half percent or so uh, decline. So this is, if you're slowing down between the ages of 30 and 50, it should be a very gradual change. Uh, there may be some other reasons for that, such as injury or some other you know, demands on your time. But physiologically, there typically is a pretty slow decline that's occurring there. However, this decline increases between, between the ages of 50 and 60. And uh, once we get to 60 years of age, things start to speed up quite a bit um, to the point where we're looking at a you know, 25% uh, decline in function between uh, ages of 80 and 90. So um, when we look at the guy on the right, Ed Whitlock, uh, this is when he set the uh, world marathon record for, I believe, a 70-year-old uh, at a running at two hours and 54 minutes. So even though we see uh, some declines in performance, uh, we're still seeing some really uh, phenomenal performances in, in older athletes. So uh, I think that's something worth keeping in mind as, as we're kind of talking through this. So why is it that we slow down with age? So this is Joan Benoit Samuelson, who is a bit of a childhood hero for me. Uh, she won the first gold medal in the marathon at the Olympics, and uh, this is in Los Angeles. And she won with a two hours and 24 minute marathon, uh, age 52. Uh, she was still uh, knocking out two hour and 15 minute marathons, which is pretty phenomenal. I believe now she's over the age of 60. And I think that uh, she's right around three hours. So, you know, there is some slowing down that's occurring. And, and so why exactly is it that that happens? Well, one of the biggest reasons is that we lose aerobic capacity as we age. And uh, the VO2 max is the cost of transport at our maximal running pace. And one of the things we see when we look at sedentary athletes or sedentary individuals is that from the ages of about 25 through age 80, we lose about 1% of our VO2 max per year. So when we look at highly trained individuals, they decline at a much slower rate. So they lose about uh, about a half a percent of their VO2 max per year, and they lose that up until about the age of 55 or so. Uh, moderately trained individuals, they lose their VO2 max at about 1% per year also. So their rate of decline is actually about the same as sedentary runners. For the highly trained individuals, one of the things that happens, though, is that we'll, we'll see this rate actually increase and accelerate as we get a little bit older. So I think it might be easy to kind of focus in on some of the, these, these declines, but I think one of the most important things to keep in mind, though, is that when you look at your, at your moderately trained runner, even though you're declining at the same rate with your VO2 max as a sedentary individual, um, your starting point is much, much higher. And this is, this is important because when you get to be the age of 60 to 80 years of age, your VO2 max is going to be more than double that of someone who is sedentary. So again, as I mentioned earlier, the older, uh, highly trained individual, they're gonna, they're, that rate's going to start accelerating once they get to the age of about 55 or 60. And the biggest reason for this is that they just have, um, they have much more to lose. And so that rate tends to kind of accelerate. But again, still at the age of 80, uh, highly trained and moderately trained individuals are still uh, double the VO2 max of um, of these sedentary individuals. One of the things that, that seems to be that we can kind of take from this data is that one of the things that seems to be very interesting is that if you continue running at, at a very high level, you do a lot of intense running, so perhaps a VO2 max uh, type intervals, so intervals maybe going to that Tuesday night track workout, uh, we're going to see that that decline is going to really slow down. So I think that that's, that's something that we can take from this, this cross-sectional data or this longitudinal data. One of the other big reasons why masters runners tend to slow down is because they tend to get injured, and injuries tend to kind of accumulate as we get as we get older. So this is uh, some really neat data from a, across a couple of different studies. This is Bill Rogers. Bill Rogers was again one, another one of my childhood heroes. He's his nickname Boston Billy because he won the Boston Marathon four times. I think he won the New York City Marathon also four times. He was really famous for running very very large mileage weeks, I think 130 to 140 miles per week. Um, but this is, uh, this is Bill Rogers when he's uh, in his prime and then Bill Rogers uh, of today. And I believe he's in his, his mid 60s. Uh, when we look at the younger athlete, um, about 45% of all young runners will suffer some sort of injury within a given year. Um, and about 24% of runners will experience multiple injuries in a given year. That rate increases when we get older. So runners tend to get injured more often. So that, that starts bumping up to around 50%. And about 30% of all runners will sustain more than one injury in a given year. There's a, there's a really kind of simple reason for that. And that's that one of the biggest predictors or strongest predictors of future risk of having an injury is if you've had that injury in the past. 
So the longer you run, the more kind of past injuries you're going to accumulate. And so you're more likely to experience those injuries again as you get older. But something else also happens too as we transition from being a younger runner to an older runner, and that's that where we get injured changes as well. So younger runners, particularly adolescent and 20-year-old runners, tend to, uh, tend to sustain most of their injuries at the knee. Uh, patellofemoral pain being the big one, IT band pain being another common injury, and also bone stress injuries, particularly of the foot and lower legs, so tibial stress fractures and metatars metatarsal stress fractures. But as we age, this shifts much more so toward it's kind of more soft tissue injuries. So we start seeing more plantar flexor strains or calf strains, and uh, Achilles tendinopathy is a really common injury as is plantar heel pain, plantar fasciopathy, which used to be called plantar fasciitis. So um, as you can see, we kind of shift from more bony or articular cartilage type injuries to more soft tissue type injuries. And there's some really important reasons for that that I think it's important for understanding how we can kind of mitigate some of these age-related changes as we, uh, as, as we get older so we can reduce our risk of sustaining more injuries. So to catch the full Dr. Rich Willie presentation, be sure to be registered. Register for free, masterathletes.com online. Now, she's been one of the most loved featured experts of the physical performance show in the past, and that is none other than Dr. Stacey Sims, author of Raw, a must lead for your sports and exercise library. And Dr. Sims will be presenting around the female masters athlete and navigating the menopausal period. Here's a snippet from Dr. Stacey Sims' presentation. So, I mean, we have all of these things that we hear um, from the Urban Dictionary. The change, age of transition, the mental pause, the menopostal. Um, so all of these are kind of catchphrases. And I bring them up because as much as the period is taboo and people don't like to talk about it, um, there's a lot of negative connotation around menopause and reaching menopause, um, especially like if you're looking at pictures uh, most of the time you'll see aging men still having uh, defined muscles as they're getting into their older imagery. But when you're seeing women, as soon as they hit 50, then you start seeing images of the Dowens or something really not very fertile or attractive women. So it's all part of that negative connotation. So part of what I want to go through is kind of identify what these stages are. And the goal, end goal is to empower women to understand what's going on so they can make changes so that they can break through that negative connotation and achieve some more performance potential. So we know that there are three distinct stages. We have perimenopause, menopause, and postmenopause. And a lot of people will, will think about menopause and that's about it. Not really understanding that the five or so years leading up to when your periods stop is really important. And this is the perimenopause state. Um, and it's technically the transition. And we see that sometimes you, you have people who enter early perimenopause between you know, mid thirties, early forties, and it can last up to 10 years. But usually we say the most, uh, not necessarily damaging, but most obvious state is the 45 years before periods actually stop. And if you go get blood tests, you'll get, um, of results that show that your progesterone is on the low end, but it hasn't completely plateaued off. Your FSH might be um, going up a little bit higher as well, but estrogen in relation to progesterone is elevating. So ironically, the body surges up with estrogen before it completely dies off. So you end up being in a little bit of an estrogen dominance space. And symptomology for like premenstrual tension actually increases. So as you start getting closer to your 50s, you might end up with more severe um, headache-driven um, symptomology, sore breasts, really erratic or heavy bleeding. And this is an indication that you're in this perimenopausal state. Um, and most of the time when you go to a physician, they're like, yeah, well, it's at your age. And they really monitor by symptom score, not so much blood tests until you get into the later stages where they can actually look at the follicle stimulating hormone, which is really elevated. Um, but most of the time it's up to symptomology. And one of the biggest things that comes out is my training and nutrition is not working for me. I used to be able to jump off the front and hold pace and chase people down, but now I'm at the back. I'm putting on extra belly fat. I don't know what's going on. I feel like I've gone squishy overnight. 
So these are the symptoms I'm used to hearing. But when you go to your physician, they're asking more about mood, um, physiological tenderness, migraines, other things that are, are more indicative of a hormonal flux. Then we get into what specifically is menopause, because we hear menopause as a blanket term, but actually it is a specific point in time that is technically 12 months of no periods. So it's really just one specific point in time. And then we actually get into the postmenopause. So this is the biological state for the rest of your life where your hormones have completely flatlined. You haven't had a period. Estradiol is very low, but you still have um, an estrogen that is active. It's estrone, um, but it's around 10 times less potent than your estradiol. And it doesn't necessarily activate the same receptor sites as your estradiol. I'll get a little bit more into that. And unfortunately, you have some women who will still experience vasomotor symptoms and perimenopausal effects for 10 or, or more years. Um, and it has to do with body composition and adipose tissue. The more adipose tissue you have, the more estrogenic states that you have. So you'll still invoke some of the estrogenic activity of vasomotor or the vasodilation, hot flashes, temperature intolerance. Um, but for the most part, we look at what's happening in that mid-stage of life. And a lot of people think that it's the postmenopausal time where we start putting on the extra belly fat, not being able to develop lean mass, having brain fog. But I'm going to point out that it's actually those four to five years in perimenopause where most of the effects take place. So if we can really hone in on that perimenopausal state, and start to put adaptations and different techniques in from a training and nutrition standpoint, then when we get to menopause, it's more of an age-associated change in body composition rather than a hormone-driven. And this is really important because most people think that it's when you hit menopause, that's when you start having all these body composition changes and it's because of the flatline of the hormones. But in actuality, it's the changing of the ratio of estrogen and progesterone that causes so many of these effects that we start to see even though we have our period. Now, we all know the benefits of strength and conditioning for all athletes, but in particular, Masters athletes. And former alumni of the Physical Performance Show, Dr. Richard Blagrove, author of Strength and Conditioning for Endurance Running, as part of the Online Masters Athlete Symposium, we'll be sharing a fantastic presentation, Strength and Conditioning for the Masters Runner. Here's a little snippet of Dr. Blaygrove's presentation. So although strength training appears to benefit performance and certainly running economy in middle and long distance runners, a survey that we uh, conducted and had published in 2000 competitive runners showed that in the older age groups, which you can see circled here on this slide, there tends to be less engagement with resistance training compared to the younger age groups, and also substantially fewer than expected older runners participate in plyometric training, which, as I mentioned before, we know offers a potent stimulus to improve strength, uh, potentially running economy, and also bone mineral density, which might offset the risk of developing stress fractures. So engaging in strength training as an older adult, it's not just important for, I've focused on mainly performance-related outcomes um, so far, but we also know that as a result of aging, we see decreases in muscle mass, which is known as sarcopenia. And this leads to decreases in levels of strength, uh, power, tendon stiffness, and just sort of general mobility and function as we become older. So there's a variety of reasons for this, but it's partly due to decreases in anabolic hormones, so testosterone in males and estrogen in females as we become older. And we also know that these reductions in strength and muscle mass can be offset with regular strength training, which obviously offers a potent stimulus to for trying to maintain these uh, different qualities um, and our function. And furthermore, in runners, there are several prospective studies that have shown that certain types of overuse injuries are related to muscular weakness, particularly in the muscles that surround the site of the injury. Um, and also muscles around the hips, so particularly the gluteal muscles. Looking a little bit more closely at injury in masters runners now, we know that masters runners typically get injured more often than, than younger runners, and this has been shown within a couple of studies. 
common injuries that we typically see in Masters runners seem to be more muscle and tendon related compared to younger runners, and particularly muscle and tendon injuries around the calf and Achilles. So there are obviously a number of different risk factors that are related to these injuries, not least previous injury, which is important to address, and obviously errors in training prescription. However, from an S&C perspective, um, improving strength and specific integrity of tissues is likely to reduce injury risk as well as um, loading to, uh, to the skeleton, which drives changes in bone renal density, and also enhancements in neuromuscular control. So these would be the areas that I would try and address in order to reduce um, injury risk. So just to finish off the presentation and get into a little bit of applied, um, applied recommendations and some specific description around strength, particularly for runners that are new to strength and conditioning, the way that I would encourage people to program is that with sessions that they dedicate towards strength and conditioning, to try and use a concurrent type approach because it doesn't take very much overload in order to achieve an adaptation in the sort of short to medium term at least. So I generally set sessions up like this whereby the first 15 to 20 minutes of the session are movement preparation, so working on mobility, neuromuscular control, uh, um, some st st stability potentially targeted activation, particularly around muscles and joints that have been injured in the past, and then move on to a section of the session, usually 10 to 15 minutes, that's plyometric training. So this might involve uh, running drills, it might involve some low-level skipping and some bilateral jumping, and potentially some close to maximal speed type work. Then move on to some, uh, some resistance training. So this might include moderate to heavy resistance training with both bilateral, so two-footed exercises, and single leg exercises, plus some upper limb work, and then finish the session with some targeted, specific, and I guess kind of quite isolationist tissue conditioning, particularly for tissues that are either vulnerable to injury or have suffered injury in the past. So for marathon runners, that largely needs to target the calf and Achilles complex, but also the gluteals, hamstring, and trunk um, as well. Now, we've all seen an explosion in the popularity and the convenience of cycling through the pandemic. So myself and Symposium co-host Benoit Matthew specifically thought it would be great to feature two experts in the field of cycling. Michael Kreben will be sharing around the rehabilitation of cycling injuries in Masters athletes and Brian McAuliffe will be sharing around key considerations for bike fit in the Masters athlete. And here's a little snippet from Brian McAuliffe's presentation, Key Considerations for bike fit in the Masters athlete. So you've got an athlete uh, in front of you, whether it's a cyclist, a triathlete, do they actually need a bike fit? Well, you know, there's some obvious ones and there's perhaps some less obvious things. So are they having pain while they're riding? When we're dealing with endurance athletes, it's really important to tease out the difference, of course, between the expected pain that you get from hard-working muscles in endurance events, so you know, the middle of the quads, the hamstrings, and so forth. So teasing out differences between whether the pain is just in the working muscles or actually the down at the tendons, is it around the joints? That sort of thing helps you to establish whether we're dealing with potentially something leading towards an overuse injury or just regular muscle discomfort from exertion. Um, the other things that we look at is some of those uh, potential early stage neuropathies that can develop. Uh, these are going to come at the contact points. So the saddle, the handlebars, and the pedals, the shoes. Um, of course, if we start to look at having pain after rides, we're then starting to be concerned about structures really being overloaded. Um, cycling doesn't develop great impact on the system, but it does develop sustained pressure. So Thinking about that in terms of your injuries and what sort of pathology you might be expecting to see is important. Um, riders with new bikes, very common. Change of geometry or road bike to a TT bike can make a dramatic difference on the expectations uh, placed upon the body to hold those positions. So again, something where a rider come in and think, I just got this new bike and actually all of a sudden this isn't right. Uh, new components, so masters athletes, very common, we'll see Masters athletes, they've got a road bike, they get into triathlon, the first thing to do is to put clip-on aero bars, so they just attach them to the regular handlebar. Now, that actually requires quite a change in setup, but what I very often see is clip-on aero bars and the exact same road setup. So something like that can very quickly start to develop hip problems, like Ben has already alluded to. Um, and then finally, looking to improve performance. Well, look, you know, we are dealing with a competitive group of athletes, and performance is key. And what we want to look at doing is finding out what metrics we can work on through bike fit to actually improve that.
So I'm sure these share-ins have piqued your interest. Once again, if you are a Masters athlete yourself looking to perform at your best, a coach working in the field or a health practitioner working in the field with Masters athletes, do not miss what will be a fantastic day of 16 world-class speakers. You must be registered to access the symposium and it's simple. Simply jump over to Master athletes.online that's master athletes.online registration once again is free and following the day the full suite of presentations and a bunch of bonus materials will be made available for a very low fee for those that wish to add it to their sports and exercise professional development library So there you have it, a bonus episode to pique your interest, but do not miss out. It's going to be a fantastic day. This coming Saturday, the 8th of August, the Online Masters Athlete Symposium. And if you are listening to this beyond the 8th of August, then do not despair. You will still be able to gain access, but only through acquiring the library of materials. Now stay tuned for this week's expert edition featuring Dr. Emmett Mystery, sports and exercise psychiatrist, focusing on the mental health of the athlete. Dr. Mystery himself is one of the speakers for this weekend's Masters Athlete Online Symposium. This topic has arguably never been more important, so be sure to be tuning in for all things around exercise addiction, how to know when it becomes maladaptive versus helpful, the role that ADHD, depression and anxiety play for athletes and so much more until then keep pursuing your physical best performance i'm brad beer and this has been the physical performance show